This next section takes us from that information about reality and starts to relate it to the situation we find ourselves in. There are 20 years between these two photographs and in that time really amazing things have happened. So many people have gone from that to that and it's an exponential curve that's gathering pace all the time. And people are starting to see what is increasingly there that we are watching the unfolding imposition of a fascist global state or communist global state. They're the same in either, either way. I'm sure people in fascist Germany and people in Stalinist uh, Russia thought there was a big difference between the worlds that they lived in. Different names for the same basic control system. But I would suggest that if we stay only at the level of the five senses, only at the level of the world we see banking scams, manipulated wars, Orwellian imposition, then we're not going to get truly what is going on. Because I say this, look at it. This world has been changing and is changing so rapidly in terms of all different aspects of this control system, the way they manipulate education, manipulate wars, put in the people they want as presidents, give us all this shite through food and drink, control the media, manufacture the global warming scam, Big Pharma, and 9-11, and all that stuff. And it's coming in in a, such a coordinated way. So if we are going to uh, think that this situation that we're seeing unfold goes back to a few men and women in dark suits or whatever sitting around a table saying what's our next move we are clearly massively missing the point and the vast majority of people who over the last few years have started investigating this they will not go any further they will not go any further because A, their belief systems won't let them, often their religious belief system, but also they are fearing what other people will think about them if they go into some of these areas I'm going to go into now. What people make of it is up to them. My right to say it is up to me. So yes, it's not just people sitting around a table somewhere in the world discussing the next move. There's the level where we see this unfolding in the news and, and what have you. Then there's this other dimensional, non-human level to look at, as I will in this section. Then there's the level of the nature of reality, which I've introduced already. And then there's this whole stuff about the moon, which I'll get into in this section too. And the rabbit hole doesn't end there. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deeper you go into the rabbit hole, the more we understand what the game is, the more we can change the game. And it's all about the control and programming of perception. That's the only way the few, and it is a few, compared with the global population, that the billions can be controlled. Manipulating how we interact with reality, keeping from us that we are consciousness, putting us in these bubbles of our sense of limitation, and I can't, manipulating the way we decode reality and therefore making us see the world as the control system wants us to see it. That's the basis of all of it going through the day because that's the basis of all of it going through the whole conspiracy. So yes, of course, on one level it does manifest as dark suits sitting around a table discussing the next move. But that's still the play out world of this conspiracy. It's not its origin. 
It goes beyond them into the advisors in the shadows, the Mandelsons in this country. Peter Mandelson, if he's not manipulating, it gets withdrawal symptoms, that man. And into the Rahm Emanuel's ditto in America, the controller, handler of Barack Obama. It goes into deeper levels beyond them, deep in the hidden secret society network. And eventually, it goes out of this dimension. And that's where this whole thing is really coming from beyond the frequency range of visible light. And it involves non-human entities, some of them people call the greys, the main ones I would say, and have been saying for a long, long time, take a reptilian form. They operate outside, they can come into visible light, but in terms of the reptilian uh, part of this, they can't stay here for that long. So people say, why don't they just come and take over? Because they can't, or they would. They can come for so long, but their vibrational uh, difference, incompatibility, means they have to uh, leave. They can't stay for long, although there are technological ways they can stay for longer. And they operate outside visible light, and they manipulate this reality through bloodlines, interbreeding bloodlines, that um, I'll come to. And we call them the Illuminati families. So, we operate with invisible light, but outside of that, sharing the same space, is infinite other worlds and realities. And if a so-called UFO comes into this reality, because it's coming into visible light from where we cannot decode, it just seems to appear out of flipping nowhere. Because what it's done, it hasn't actually come in, it's just changed its vibrational state to resonate with invisible light, and it's like, it came out of nowhere. And then how often do you see it? Honestly, mate, there was this bloody UFO and it disappeared just in front of me eyes. You are, what are you on, mate? You on the pop or what? What it's done is increased its vibrational resonance to go beyond on, on visible light. Therefore, to the observer, it disappears. It doesn't disappear at all. It's left visible light. And this range of frequency we call our world is being manipulated from vibrational frequencies beyond it. And Satanism is a network within visible light that interacts with these reptilian entities in various ways I'll get to before the end of the day. Places or areas of the heavens that come up, Orion comes up again and again in relation to these reptilians. And in terms of non-human visitations, uh, so does the Pleiades, so does, in terms of the uh, reptilians, this area of the heavens they call the Draco constellation, which appropriately, coming through the word derivations, brings us draconian. And of course, draconian laws are the Orwellian laws coming in. Very, very appropriate. Sirius is involved as well. So, I won't be able to get into this today. There's a lot more to know anyway, but so is what happened to Mars. It's all involved in this story, how it became the devastated place it was, but it is, but wasn't before. And when I talk about these areas of the heavens, I'm not necessarily talking about those places with invisible light. Because just as we are multidimensional, so planets and stars, etc., are multidimensional. And just as a planet might be devastated within visible light, it's not necessarily devastated on other vibrational frequency levels of itself. Because the Earth, too, operates in visible light, but also multi levels, like everything else. Another major part of this story is that when these reptilian entities started intervening, they manipulated human genetics through interbreeding, not necessarily physical interbreeding, interbreeding through technological methods, and also changing human form by changing the messages, the information, I'll come to this before we finish this section, that the DNA is picking up. And through that, you can change a form by changing the um, information the DNA is picking up. And it's no accident that humans have massive, fundamental reptilian genetics. This part of the brain, which uh, scientists call the R-complex or the reptilian brain, will be very, very important as we go through this second part of the day, because it's fundamental to how human behavior and human perception is manipulated to see the world as we currently see it. This interbreeding is talked about and recorded all across the world in the ancient accounts. Of course, I guess because it's the Bible, 
The best known is this section from Genesis. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were the old men of renown. But that's just the biblical version. <coughs> Got a frog in my throat, the reptilian guy. Um, all across the ancient world, you see similar stories and accounts of this interbreeding. Something else goes parallel with the reptilian story. Again, not just in the Bible with the Garden of Eden and all that stuff, which of course the serpent was dominant, but across the ancient accounts. And that is the connection between the reptilian intervention <clears throat> and what we call the fall of man. And again, this is universal. And these themes will come together again and again as we go through this next part. The ancient accounts again, and we're talking that part of the Yuga cycle, which they call the Golden Age, talk about the fact that there was a time when humans were so unbelievably different to how we are today. They were connected to higher, higher levels of consciousness. They were in this world, but they were certainly not of it. They were capable of incredible feats, and they lived what we would call impossible lengths of time in terms of age. And then there was a sudden change. The fall of man, as it was called. What I call this is the schism. There was an energetic schism at the level of the metaphysical universe, the waveform based information construct, and that, as it was decoded through into this holographic reality, obviously mirrored in the holographic play out world the schism in the information construct. And this is a portrayal of that, a symbolic portrayal of that. Anything that happens here gets decoded through to there, and this is where the schism happened. It was like a distortion in the information. Thanks, mate. Cheers. You put the gin in, right? It was a distortion in the base information construct, and I'll be coming to uh, how that happened. There were many consequences for this, and one of them was it wasn't just a schism in the energetic uh, level of, and, of the world itself. There was a schism was passed through into human personalities. We became distorted also from the magnificence and harmony that we were before. And we went from that to this. And we're now at the point where we're coming out of that. And there was also genetic manipulation to stop us accessing ranges of frequency that we did before. This is a major reason, not the only reason, but it is a major reason why scientists call 95% of human DNA junk DNA because they don't know what it does. This is the reason, not the only reason, but a major reason why we only use a fraction of our brain's capacity. This is why billions of cells in that bridge, the corpus callosum, don't seem to be doing anything. They've been switched off. We've been put into a state that disconnects us and therefore makes us controllable, makes us farmable. So you've got this reptilian group, and the ones involved appear to be relatively small in number, tiny compared with the global population, and this is why they're terrified of being exposed. That's a constant, constant theme, all the way through it, wherever you look. And they've imprisoned humanity or sought to in this tiny, tiny frequency range of perception called visible light. Another key aspect to this is that they created hybrid bloodlines specifically to be the middle men and women. They became known in the ancient world as the demigods, the people, the children of the gods, part human, part god, as these serpent gods were perceived. And they were to be, like I say, the middlemen of, and women operating in visible light for the outside visible light control system. 
And it's appropriate that the caduceus and the symbol of the medical profession is the DNA, in effect, portrayed as two snakes. Because to these reptilian geneticists who were far, far ahead of where we are in the public arena in terms of genetics and understanding, the DNA is a software program. And so they manipulate it for their own means. And this is crucial to understand the world that we live in. One seriously important aspect to this DNA, this hybrid DNA I'm talking about, is that it has eliminated what we call empathy. The ability to decode the emotion of empathy. Empathy is the fail-safe mechanism of all behavior. If I can empathize with the consequences for others of my actions, that limits my, and balances my actions. If I have no empathy because I cannot empathize, then there are no limits. There is nothing that won't do. 3,000 dead on 9-11, <laughs> who cares? Who cares? That's what we're dealing with. And this is, an, this, is, this is vital to get across. If we look at this information on the basis of thinking, I wouldn't do that, so they wouldn't do it, then we're going to miss the plot completely. Because that's not like that. No, you wouldn't do it. They would and have no emotional comeback whatsoever. The reason for the interbreeding, the hybrid, is vibrational compatibility. These hybrids have a greater infusion of reptilian DNA than the general population, although we have a lot. And therefore, the resonance is sympathetic to the resonance of these entities operating just outside visible light. And through this resonant connection, like two radio stations talking to each other, the possessing entity outside of visible light can control the thoughts, actions, perceptions of the intermediary, the demigod. And of course, the theme of possession is as old as history, right up to the present day. We look at these people, all these pictures are by Neil Haig, by the way, anything that looks like this, great, great, great friend of mine, great artist. And this image symbolizes the fact that he looks at him with invisible light and he sees George Bush, nothing else. What people don't see, because it's outside the frequency range of their decoding system, is there are um, entities around these people who are actually controlling these people's um, thoughts, actions, etc. A number of psychics have said to me around the world how they've seen people walking along the street or wherever, and then they've seen like an ethereal reptilian entity locking into these bottom two chakra points, the emotional uh, level one of them is, and floating around with them. And this is a, a, a kind of a good analogy. You know when uh, there's scientists in a laboratory and they're trying to work with something that they can't touch because it's too dangerous? What they're working with will be in a tank and they'll put gloves on which allows them to be outside the tank but to, to manipulate inside the tank. Well, that is a very good symbol of what I'm talking about. These Illuminati bloodlines, these hybrid bloodlines operate like those gloves, operating inside this reality. And Neil symbolizes these Illuminati families with invisible light as this bearded man. Whenever you see him as we go along, that is symbolic of the Illuminati families controlled beyond human sight by these reptilian entities. When the world started to recover from great geological catastrophes, which I'll come to in a second, there were areas of the world that stood out in terms of their abilities and potentials and advancement. These were some of them. And this area is particularly important to the bloodlines I'm talking about. The area that was once called Sumer, thousands of years BC, and became Babylon. This is why Babylon comes up in the writings of these people uh, so often. And it's Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. They didn't invade Iraq just for oil or just for anything. They didn't invade it for one thing, but multiple things. But one reason they're so obsessed with Iraq is because to these bloodlines in control of the world today, this is a very significant, almost religious piece of land of historical importance to them.
As Sumer and Babylon broke up, these bloodlines started going walkabout. They became the royal families of the world. And what do royal families claim? The right to rule because of the divine right to rule. The Chinese emperors used to claim the right to be emperor because of their genetic connection to the serpent gods. And this is a theme all the way across the world between the serpent gods and royalty. They became the aristocracy and the royal families claiming the right to rule because of their DNA. Just down the bloody road from here, we have a head of state in Britain to this day who is only head of state because of her DNA. Head of state because of her DNA. I actually uh, made a complaint, nothing happened to it, but I made a complaint to the uh, Race Relations Commission or whatever they call it. They said, if you see racism, report it. So I reported the royal family. I thought, well, I mean, well, you would. You would, because they, they go, racism, we must stop racism. All these bloody politicians go, well, get down to Buckingham Palace then. You're saying you can only be head of state, not only if you're bloody white, effectively, but if you only come from the same bloody family. Ridiculous. Anyway, it's always been and it still is. And so these uh, aristocratic and royal families moved on. Eventually, when the people started to rebel against overt royal control, dictatorship, these families, some of them stayed in the royal families overtly, and there's still some around, like ours. But these families moved into politics, into banking, into business, and became the dark suit, so, but they still perceived themselves as royalty, as special because of this genetic connection to the serpent gods. And through the, great, the British Empire, the so-called Great British Empire, and the other European empires, as these uh, bloodlines moved up into Europe from the Middle East, etc., they exported these bloodlines all over the world. And we saw them in power in what we call colonization. But there's two types of control. One has a finite life, one can go on forever until it's exposed. The one that has a finite life is a dictatorship that the people under dictatorship can see, touch, and taste. Communism, fascism, apartheid. People know where they stand and eventually, therefore, they will rebel against it because they know what they're dealing with. The greatest form of control is a control you can't see. Prison without the bars. You can't see the bars because you'll just sit there. People do not rebel against not being free when they think they are. And that's the idea um, of replacing the colony control with another kind of control called freedom. So what happened is as these um, colonies, like, like the United States as it became, etc., and all the others around the world, as they were given independence, what was left out in those countries were the bloodline, under different names, the secret society network that manipulates the bloodline agenda, and those countries have gone on being controlled ever since. But because they have the ability to have a vote every four or five years, they don't realize they live in a tyranny. And that's how it works, the prison without the bars, and until it's exposed, it'll go on forever. And so these kind of people, especially the Rothschilds, they are major, major players in this. They are the middlemen for the manipulation of this reality from these entities mostly outside of this reality. And what they've created is like a global transnational corporation. What you have with a corporation is you have a headquarters somewhere in the world, and then in each country you have subsidiary companies of that headquarters, that central point. And all the subsidiaries in the world carry out the policy of the central point. Well, what these Illuminati hybrid family networks have done is create exactly the same, but instead of companies, they are secret society networks. So you've got the center of the web in Europe, for historical reasons, uh, at operational level anyway, people at places like London, not the British government, the secret society center in London, in um, Rome is another one, the Roman church, Rome and, and other points in Europe. And then in each country, you have families from the network in those countries whose job it is, is to run the networks that control that country's business, banking, politics, media, all of it. And so what you have is from this central point in Europe, the center of the web, 
all these different places and countries all over the world then impose on their country what is being dictated here. And that's why as I travel around the world, I see the same things being introduced in different countries at the same time, overwhelmingly justified by the same excuses. It's all a global uh, network. It can be symbolized too as a, a web, like I say, with the Rothschilds real close to the spider and all these different strands on the web are different secret societies, different semi-secret societies, transnational corporations and all the rest of it. So when you see all these different names of these corporations that dominate uh, the world in so many ways and the pharmaceutical cartel and the oil cartel and all the rest of it, the biotech cartel, they're all different names or different masks on the same one face. And so you have this structure where Outside of visible light, you have the reptilian control system comes down through the Illuminati families and they control the people in power to push the world in a certain direction. Another way of looking at it here. You see, all these different people, these, these fight among themselves and all the rest of it, though if it gets out of hand, they get sorted. So these sit on the top of all these different countries. They control these different um, areas of their societies and the people um, are then played off against each other. These buggers don't go to war, they tell these buggers to go to war. And if we stop going to bloody war, game over. But we do. Ridiculous. That's part of becoming conscious. So these people are just pawns in a game in a way, genetic pawns in a game. They're just kind of shells to play out this agenda with invisible light. I mean, some batches are better than others, of course. So if you look at the, the principle of the Trojan horse, the symbol of the Trojan horse, coming into a society and not seeming to be what it is, though taking it over, and you put that on the face, well, you pretty much got symbolically what we're talking about. People send me uh, pictures from around the world and stuff uh, that they find on the internet and elsewhere, which have a kind of reptilian feel about them. I'm not saying these are reptilian eyes, it could be a trick of the light, but I've used it because it gives an indication of the number of people that have told me this all around the world, from all walks of life, how they've seen people shift in, from a human to a reptilian state, and especially the eyes, the eyes are the first to go. They, they describe how the pupils become reptilian. And interestingly, a great friend of mine has uh, an associate who, I don't agree with it, but he's been doing a, a research project to develop iris scan technology, and it led to him looking very deeply into 2,300 eyes and he said he knew nothing about what I'm saying, probably never heard of me. Um, and he, he said to my friend, it was, the amazing thing was that about 4% appeared to be of reptilian type and appearance. And that is a, a recurring number, in my research anyway, 4 5% seem to be of this hybrid nature. So these people are reptilian hybrid human reptilians. And you, you look at the eyes, but behind the eyes are something else. I had an experience with this guy, Ted Heath. He was Prime Minister of Britain from 1970 to 74, took us into the European Union as it became. And I, it's a long story, I've told it before, but he, he looked at me um, in a dressing room in a television station. And as he looked at me, this is what his eyes did. His eyes went completely black, everything. And as I looked into his eyes, it must have been like that for, I don't know, maybe a minute, two minutes. And as I looked into his eyes, I said at the time, it was like looking into two black holes because you couldn't make eye contact because there was no contact. And I, I, it was like, as I know now, looking through him into this other dimension where he was really controlled from. This man, Ted Heath, oh my goodness me. My goodness me, the children that guy has tortured and killed. And I've been saying this since 1998 in print, and he was alive for many, 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 many years after that. And nothing happened. Why? Because it's true. And so these people are like hiding behind human form. And hey, I rest my case. I rest my case. <laughs> Ooh, you look tasty. And this lack of empathy in this hybrid DNA explains why these guys do what they do. Now, when you open your mind, instead of saying, well, it's not possible, it's ridiculous, when you open your mind and say, okay, 
I'm not going to just accept this stuff, I'm, but I'm going to flow with it and see where it goes. You find that this stuff I'm talking about is absolutely in your face when you bring it from the subliminal to the conscious. The oldest form of religious worship in the world has been taken back 70,000 years uh, to an area of the Kalahari Desert in South Africa, and it is worship of the serpent or worship of the snake. This man, Reverend John Bathurst Dean, uh, wrote a book, very, very good book, 1933, called Worship of the Serpent, in which he studied serpent worship around the world. This was his conclusion. It appears then that no nations were so geographically remote or so religiously discordant, but that one and only one so superstitious characteristic was common to all, that the most civilized and the most barbarous bowed down with the same devotion to the same engrossing deity, and that this deity either was or was represented by the same sacred serpent. It appears also that in most, if not all, the civilized countries where this serpent was worshipped, some fable or tradition which involved its history directly or indirectly alluded to the fall of man in paradise in which the serpent was concerned. What follows then, but that the most ancient account respecting the cause and nature of this seduction must be the one from which all the rest are derived, which represent the victorious serpent, victorious over man in a state of innocence and subduing his soul in a state of sin, as he would call it as a reverend, into the most abject veneration and adoration of himself. Like I say, wherever you go, it comes up. You find obvious representations of the serpent gods. These were found in graves of the Ubaid people that preceded Sumer in what we now call Iraq. These were the Nagas, the shape-shifting reptilian uh, people of Asia. The Egyptians used to worship serpent gods and represent their pharaohs as a result of that in this way. In Central America, you had Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god, and the Mayan version of it was Kukulkan, um, in places like Chichen Itza. Uh, of course, right across Asia, Japan, China, etc., the very most dominant symbol of that part of the world is the dragon, which comes from this worship of the serpent gods. Folklore is full of serpent uh, stories and, and, and what have you. When I first met Credo Mutwa, a long time ago now, he contacted me when I was going around South Africa, this Zulu shaman, the official historian of the Zulu nation, uh, because he'd read in a book called The Biggest Secret that I'd introduced this reptilian stuff for the first time, and he said, Mr. David, how do you know? How do you know about the Chittahuri? And I didn't know about the Chittahuri. Tell me. And he told me the story of African history where the Chittahuri, which translates as children of the serpent or children of the python, had taken over the world in the very same way that other parts of the ancient world described it. This is a painting that he did of one type of this Chittahuri from ancient and modern accounts. And he showed me this called the Necklace of the Mysteries. It says a necklace, it's very, very heavy, copper, and it goes on your shoulders. How he keeps it on his shoulders, I'll never know, it's so heavy. And he uses it as the historian of the Zulu nation, the symbols hanging from it, to tell the story of Africa and the world in general. And pride of place on the front is a non-human entity with a, a willy in come and get me mode and a human woman. And I said to him, what's all that about? And he said, this is uh, symbolic of the interbreeding of the Chittahuri and humans to create these hybrid bloodlines, these children of the serpent. And then I asked him, oh, by the way, that's uh, copper now, but in the original, and this necklace of the mysteries, by the way, is mentioned in accounts 500 years old, and Credo reckons it's about 1,000 years old, and it has a flying saucer on it, very clearly, uh, a flying saucer hanging from it, which the storytelling says that's where, how the Chittahuri came here. Anyway, this is copper now, but it used to be gold. Someone stole it, and they couldn't afford to put gold back, and that takes us to North Africa and Egypt, and the the, the base story of the Egyptian myths, and that's the golden penis of Osiris, which all relates into this golden bloodline, this special bloodline. And when I said to Credo, what, what, why is it um, not reptilian? He said, because the Chittahuri, and this is a theme I've found all over the place, the Chittahuri said, you must not portray us as we really are. Some people did, most people didn't. They had to do it symbolically. So 
they made it absolutely obviously not human, but not reptilian for fear of the consequences. And when I was writing uh, the new book, uh, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees, I came across um, a work in progress, I think it's finished now, by um, a man called Pierre Sabak, and he was producing a book called The Murder of Reality. And Pierre Sabak spent seven years nearly pouring through dictionaries, he's crazy about words and derivatives, pouring through dictionaries and, and what have you, of all these different peoples and different languages and different eras. And he put together the fact that the language, the very language, if you follow the derivatives back from the language we use now and their origins, where the words came from, tell the story of this reptilian serpent god race taking over um, humanity and also how they used to symbolize this race for reasons I've just said, not as they really were, but as uh, eagles, as hawks, as owls, as angels. If you take the word angel back to its origin in Sabak's research, you get a word meaning snake or serpent. And so we have the eagle on so many countries' um, flags and logos, including the United States most famously. You have the owls uh, invariably with the, the goddess of Babylon, Semiramis or Ishtar. You have the story of the angels, especially the um, theme of the fallen angels, representing this reptilian uh, race and interbreeding with humanity. And you have Horus, the son of God of uh, Egypt, the virgin-born son, represented as a hawk, again with the uh, reptilian um, imagery. This uh, seraphim, one of the hierarchy of angels in Christian and um, Hebrew uh, Jewish belief, seraphim word means snake or serpent if you take it back to its origin. You have the, the flying serpent disc which is widely used in the ancient world. And another thing that they did was they symbolized the heavens as the upper ocean. We have the ocean that we have, obviously, and then you had the upper ocean, which was the heavens. And so they talked about the gods and the serpent gods coming in their heavenly boats through the upper ocean. And so you have a lot of marine symbolism, which doesn't relate to the sea, it relates to the upper ocean. And it's reading this. These bloodlines were known in the ancient world under different symbols and different codes, like children from heaven and earth, and um, children of the gods, children of the sky. And another big symbol of these um, gods, these serpent gods, were the watchers. They were called the watchers. This is widely, widely found. And that's why there's an eye, as Credo Mutwa confirmed, on that hand on the necklace of the mysteries. That's the watchers. That's the serpent gods. And that's why we have the eye on top of the pyramid, the all-seeing eye on the dollar bill, and why that is a massive Illuminati symbol in the secret society network. They are the gods overseeing the pyramid of control. One way uh, that they often symbolized these hybrid bloodlines in the ancient world was as part human, down, down to the bottom of the torso, and then the legs, or the bottom part, being a snake. You come across this a great deal when you research this stuff. This is all symbolic of this half human, half snake symbolism. Over and over and over again you see it. And the, the cobra, like I say, is very much... Uh, a common symbol of these serpent gods, as is fighting the serpent gods and battles with them. Even uh, the word Messiah comes from Mesa, the Nile crocodile, which they use the oil from the Nile crocodile to anoint the pharaohs. And even today in the British coronation um, ceremony, they symbolize that as part of our own ceremony appropriately. Um, in the Bible, the devil is symbolized or described in reptilian terms. The old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Fallen angels, again the recurring theme. All these folk tales about uh, kissing frogs and turning into princes and uh, invariably uh, you get reptilian themes, all part of the same story. And people send me images from all over the world as a result of the information I've put out. It's amazing how many times you see the symbol of reptile and humans, or part human, part reptile, or overseeing the gargoyles in the, the palaces and castles and churches of this elite are symbolic of that. And of course, over the last, well, I don't know, 20 years or so, there's been a massive reptilian symbolism in children's stories and children's entertainment. And then recently, I mean, you saw this, it's 
quick one. The, this 16th century painting in the National Portrait Gallery of Queen Elizabeth I, they thought she was holding flowers because that's what someone had painted over. But with where, um, what's underneath is coming to light. And this is a representation of it. It was in one of the papers. Again, holding the snake, very, very appropriate. And these um, aristocratic families, which became the hybrids, again, used reptilian dragon and all these other serpent images on their various coats of arms and what have you. And one of the centers, like I said earlier, is London. Not Lo necessarily London, the great conurbation, but the city of London and the temple that runs into the city of London. The city of London, of course, being the great center of not just British finance, but global finance. And how appropriate that they, too, have the symbol of the flying dragon and the symbol of the Knights Templar Secret Society, a major strand in this web of secret societies, as the very symbol of the city of London. You pass these as you go into the city, of course. Another theme you find with images around the world is of serpents eating humans. And not nice, it isn't, of course, but they do eat humans. When these um, reptilians uh, come into visible light, they use humans as their food, like humans use animals, cattle, sheep. And then um, you'll see the recurring theme all over the world. This is in Central America, the Mayan area. This is uh, a painting by uh, Credo Mutwa from uh, South African myths of the serpent gods, the Chitahuri eating humans. And this is Alfa Romeo. What's he doing there? What's he bloody doing there? Same thing. And in... Uh, the garden of one of the palaces or whatever you call the mansions of Silvio Berlusconi in Italy, the leader and one of the world's most corrupt men, is again the same image. And outside of visible light, they feed off human energy, human emotion, especially, well, only low vibrational emotion because that's all they can really access. And so they have to keep humans in a state of mental and emotional suppression so that we keep uh, feeding out this energy which they then absorb and um, that will become relevant in the, the next section when I get into why pedophilia is so widespread among this elite because um, energy changes with the emotions we give out when we give out love it's a certain wavelength when we give out hate it's a very different wavelength and uh, the friend of mine in, um, in, in Japan has became very well known for taking water, name's Mr. Emoto, taking water, putting it in um, a container, and then he'll put words of love or hate or whatever on the side of it, because when you write a word, that word may seem in the decoded realm as a word you can see and read, but in the vibrational realm, it represents a vibration. If you could see the vibration of, of writing the word hate to the word, writing the word love, it would be dramatic. In fact, you're looking at it. Because what happens is, he, after he's put the word um, on the side of the water, he then freezes the water really, really fast. I've seen his laboratory where he does it. And then he photographs the crystals. This is the crystal from a water that had love and appreciation written on it. This is the crystal that had hate written on the side of the water. And he's done whole books about, about this stuff with all these pictures in it. And this is the energy that these entities absorb when they're outside of visible light, which is most of the time. And therefore, they have to keep us in a state that keeps producing that. All this vampire stuff, because they drink human blood with invisible light because it carries the human genetic code and allows them to hold their vibrational compatibility with this reality for longer before they have to get the hell out of it. That's why they drink so much blood. And then there's this thing about um, shape-shifting, where, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, laughter and ridicule, so what's bloody new about this? And people say, um, well, you, you can't go from a solid body to a solid body and back again. And I'm saying, do you know? I agree with you. Of course you can't. But that's not what's happening, because there is no solid body. It's all happening as a decoding system. There is no solidity. So, what shape-shifting is, is you have a situation like this and the, f the, f the front f dominating from our perception of, of, of observation energy field is the human one. So we look at George Bush or somebody and we see a human. But sometimes, especially at times of high emotion, 
This shift can happen where the reptilian field comes forward. And as it does so, becomes the dominant one, often briefly, the observer now starts decoding that. And then it shifts back and you start decoding this. And to, to the observer decoding that shift, creating the holographic reality in their head, which is where everything happens, to their observation, someone's gone from a human to a reptilian and then back to human again. It's not, of course, shifting solidity. She's a hologram like we're all holograms and they can shift. This is where shape-shifting happens, what we call physical shape-shifting, illusory, in our heads. So the road to tyranny began when these reptilians arrived. Before that, like I say, the world was very different. The golden age, the time when humans were just extraordinary before the suppression. And then came this energetic schism, this distortion in the information construct which got played out into the holographic world as, on one level as massive geological events with volcanoes and, and, and storms and, and what have you. And of course symbolized by Noah and the Great Flood, though there have been many of these, not just one. Um, and Noah is simply a biblical version of much, much older stories that tell exactly the same story of how the earth turned over how there was a massive uh, flood, tidal waves, what we call today as tsunamis, how there were great geological catastrophes and upheavals, and basically the world was, certainly the society that went before, was destroyed, it was a blank sheet of paper. And in this distortion, humans lost the power of the connection they had to higher levels of awareness, and this happened. We went from being part of the field, knowingly so, and to being taken over and suppressed by this reptilian race. Because once the blank sheet of paper was created by the geological catastrophe, and why that happened I'll come to not very long from now, the earth um, started to settle down, and when it settled down then everything started to be rebuilt, but in a very, very different, much lower level than it was before. And there was the genetic manipulation too. And in China, unlike most other countries, you can't access vast tracts of the internet because the computer system has been firewalled off to stop Chinese people accessing that area of the internet that the authorities don't want them to see. What happened as a part of this intervention, I kind of hit, mentioned it a little earlier, is that human genetics were manipulated to do exactly the same to us to firewall off us from the level of reality that we could access before. So we went into this prison called Visible Light that we've been in ever since. And particularly isolated in the left side of the brain so that we only perceive through the five senses and we can only see structure and language and a hierarchy and all that stuff and our potential dramatically, dramatically reduced. And this world came as a result of it. And it's dominated by controlling human perception, by suppressing our true self and dictating what we uh, bring into holographic reality. Okay, now let's go really crazy. I've had enough of only being half crazy. Let's do the bloody lot, eh? <laughs> what I want to say before I go into this, is this. One of the most profound ways that people are controlled is to limit their sense of possibility. It, your sense of possibility becomes your sense of what is possible. Now that's an obvious thing and it's a truism, but often we miss what's in front of our eyes. In other words, if you can program a sense of what's possible, and make it narrow and incredibly limited, then when people come along and say, this is going on, these people say, you're bloody mad. That's not possible, is it? No, you don't believe it's possible. Talking to some of the ins insiders that I have over the years uh, and, and talking to other people who've done the same, 
they, there is a, a feeling among some of them that these entities technologically, and I, I keep emphasizing, there's not that many of them compared with humans, and so therefore they, um, they have to keep out of sight, and that's the, one of the reasons, the major reason they want to cull the global population, because it's out of hand from their point of view. Um, well, stick around, it's going to be out of hand a bit more <laughs> very soon. Um, but they reckon, some of them, that this technology that these people are working with, these entities are working with, is like 10,000 years ahead of where we are. But to, it, that's a bit of a misnomer because there's, there's a line, like a Rubicon, of awareness of how reality works. And when you're this side of it, you are in a state of tremendous limitation. But once you cross it, and, and you, by, by realizing the nature of reality that I've been talking about today, suddenly you can move very fast in terms of um, your ability and your potential and all the rest of it. But while we're here, they reckon we're there about 10,000 years ahead. Um, so we're dealing not with what we can do, but with what very advanced technological entities will do. Not spiritually advanced, intellectually, technologically advanced. What happened was that I was writing this latest book, and I sat down one morning. I've had one or two thoughts about this before, but they've come and gone. But I sat down one morning at the computer to start writing. And it was like, I've had this so many times in my life in the last 20 years. It was like an energy field descends upon me, and suddenly I just knew the moon was not what it seems to be. It wasn't the heavenly body, the natural phenomenon that we believe that it is. And from that moment, information started to come to me in the five sense world, uh, pointing to exactly that. Again, we come back to that line 20 years ago, knowledge will be put into his mind and at other times he will be led to knowledge. This combination has been constantly repeating and it gets more and more powerful. First I get an insight out of nowhere, the, the moon's not real, where, where, where's that come from? And then suddenly it starts. I went on the internet and within two, three minutes, I was expecting to find nothing. I just put on a few words indicating the, 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 the moon's not real in, the, in the, the, sen the sense that we think it is. And bingo, within two, two, three minutes or less, I'd found this book, Who Built the Moon? by two researchers who written other books. Um, one of them an investigation to Freemasonry. And this book um, details the extraordinary anomalies relating to the moon. And they came to the conclusion, and I absolutely bloody agree with them, and, and, and a bit more than, than that too, as I'll come to later, that this is the, what we're looking at. Um, the, the, the geometrical connections and everything, and, and the uh, mathematics and the relationship between them in terms of size and position is just mind-blowing. And what I'm suggesting, and I, I'm not alone over the years, uh, at this level of it, though I think I might be alone on the next bit that I'll come to in a second or a few minutes. Um, <laughs> I've been there before, I don't mind. Um, is that the moon is actually a hollowed out planetoid by a very, very advanced uh, race and it was brought here to t take the Earth over. And what they do, this seems to be a modus operandi. They bring these moons in and as they bring them in, they fundamentally affect the earth. I mean, the earth is at the spin it is and is at the angle it is because of the moon. A lot, massively so anyway, to, because of the moon. So when they come in, bingo, um, things change and the society that was there before ain't there anymore. And then gradually they take them over in ways that I'll, I'll come to. Um, so when the moon came in, and again, it's so important to come back from the holographic world to the base construct. We see a, a solid moon, yes, in the play out world. But back here, it is an energetic construct in the metaphysical universe. And as it came in, it cre and, and other things that happened, which I talk about in the book, it created this distortion in the information construct of the waveform information uh, base of this universe. And as it did so, it was played out here in all this catastrophe and stuff that I talked about and the ancients talk about. Um, it was played out as this great geological catastrophe and, and, and the great flood and all the rest of it. And what is a common theme that they talk about, the ancients, in, in, in relation to this? The earth turned over. And you think, how freaking hell can the earth turn over? Well, what happened? What, what, what happened when the moon came in, the earth turned over? 
It's at an angle that it is today because of the moon. And so the distortion brought an end to the world that was there before, and we went, basically went back to rubbing sticks together because of what happened. And that distortion was played out in the human mind, the human perception, the human psyche, and we completely changed our perception of the world and who we are, where we are. So in Who Built the Moon, like I say, I do recommend it, um, the way it looks at um, the anomalies and everything, and the connections um, between these three bodies. And these mathematical, um, geometrical um, connections only apply to these three bodies in the solar system. They don't play out against the other planets, ju and, uh, just these three. And the, the moon is so perfectly positioned that because of where it is, when we have an eclipse, it is the same size as the sun. That's why we have the eclipse. And the authors of Who Built the Moon say this, the moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, and much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties, and none of them could cons be considered remotely watertight. When, when you go on and you say, where'd the moon come from, you get this story. And like so much in what we call science, that people take it as fact, it's actually a theory which repeated becomes fact. But then you go back and you find that it's the theory. And the first one is the moon was created by what's known as the whack theory or the big whack theory. And that is that a Mars-type planet came in, smacked the Earth, great chunk came off and became the moon. When the physics of that didn't work out, they came up with the double whack theory, where the Mars-type planet hit the Earth, bit comes off or whatever, and then the Mars-type planet thinks, well, I'll give him, I'll give him one with the right, I'll give him one with the left, comes back and whacks it again, the old one too. Talk about bloody desperate. And the truth is, and, and, and honest scientists will tell you, they have no bloody clue where the moon come from, and it shouldn't, by physics, be there. This guy, um, Isaac Asmanov, a Russian professor of biochemistry, did a lot of writing on, on, on this sort of stuff, and he said this, quite rightly, we cannot help but come to the conclusion that the moon by rights ought not to be there. The fact that it is, is one of those strokes of luck almost too good to accept. Small planets such as Earth with weak gravitational fields might well lack satellites. In general then, when a planet does have satellites, those satellites are much smaller than the planet itself. Therefore, even if the Earth has a satellite, there would be every reason to suspect that at best it would be a tiny world, perhaps 30 miles in diameter. But that is not so. Earth is not only has a satellite, but it is a giant satellite, 2,160 miles in diameter. How is it then that that tiny Earth has one? Amazing. Some scientists don't even talk about a planet satellite relationship, but a planet-planet relationship. The moon's bigger than Pluto. The best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist, that scientist said. Another one from NASA, it seems easier to explain the non-existence of the moon than its existence. And then we get the hollow moon. This is what I'm saying, and others have said, is that it's a hollowed out planetoid. In November 1969, the moon was hit by a lunar module to the equivalent of one ton of TNT. The shock waves built up and NASA scientists said the moon rang like a bell. Morris Ewing, a co-director of the seismic experiment, told the news conference, as for the meaning of it, I'd rather not make an interpretation right now, but it is as though someone had struck a bell, say in the belfry of a church, a single blow, and found that the reverberation from it continued for 30 minutes. It got a bigger smack eventually, which I'll come to. Frank uh, Press from the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, MIT, said that for a rather small impact to produce an effect that lasted for 30 minutes was quite beyond the range of our experience. This is a, a guy called Gordon MacDonald. He said in the early 1960s, it would seem that the moon is more like a hollow than a homogeneous sphere. And this guy from MIT said the lunar orbiter experiments had vastly improved knowledge of the moon's gravitational field and indicated the frightening possibility that the moon might be hollow. Now um, we'll come to this bigger whack. 
uh, a launch vehicle struck the moon with the equivalent of 11 tons of TNT, and NASA scientists said the moon reacted like a gong and continued to vibrate for three hours and 20 minutes to a depth of up to 25 miles. Um, Ken Johnson, a supervisor of the data and photo control department during the Apollo missions, told Who Built the Moon author Alan Butler that the moon not only rang like a bell, but the whole moon wobbled in such a precise way that it was almost as though it had gigantic hydraulic damper struts inside it. These two Russian scientists from the Soviet Academy of Scientists wrote an article in 1970 in Sputnik magazine in Russia headed, Is the Moon the Creation of an Alien Intelligence? And all these years later, um, it indicates to the fact that they were right. What they point out, and others point out, is the outer surface of the moon is extremely hard and contains minerals like titanium. Moon rocks have been found to contain processed metals, including brass and mica, and the elements uranium-236 and neptunium-237 that have never been found to occur naturally. Uranium-236 is a long-lived radioactive nuclear waste and is found in spent nuclear fuel and reprocessed uranium. Neptunium-237 is a radioactive metallic element and a byproduct of nuclear reactors and the production of uh, plutonium. Some lunar rocks have been found to contain 10 times more titanium than titanium-rich rocks on Earth. Titanium is used in supersonic jets, deep diving submarines and, the, and spacecraft. Dr. Harold Urey, the uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, said he was terribly puzzled by the rocks from the moon and in particular their titanium content. He said the samples were mind blowers and that he could not account for the titanium. The two Russian scientists said in their article, if a material had to be devised to protect a giant artificial satellite from the unfavorable effects of temperature from the cosmic radiation and uh, meteorite bombardment, the experts would probably have hit upon precisely these refractory metals. Refractory metals are incredibly um, uh, resistant to heat and wear. In that case, is it not clear why lunar rock is such a, an extraordinarily poor heat conductor, a factor which so amazed the astronauts? Wasn't that what the designers of this super Sputnik of the Earth were after? From the engineer's point of view, this spaceship of ages long past, which we call the moon, is superbly um, constructed. They say uh, it's a hollowed out planetoid, and they say if you're going to launch an artificial Sputnik, then it is advisable to make it hollow. At the same time, it would be naive to imagine that anyone capable of such a tremendous space project would be satisfied simply with some kind of giant empty trunk um, hurled into a uh, near-Earth uh, trajectory. It is more likely that what we have here is a very ancient spaceship, the interior of which was filled with fuel for the engines and materials and appliances for repair work, navigation instruments, observation equipment, and all manner of machinery. In other words, everything necessary to enable this caravel of the universe to serve as a Noah's Ark, appropriate, of intelligence, perhaps even as the home of a whole civilization envisaging a prolonged thousands of millions of years existence and long wanderings through space thousands of millions of miles. Naturally, the hull of such a spaceship must be super tough in order to stand up to the blows of meteorites and sharp fluctuations between extreme heat and extreme cold. Probably the shell is a double-layered affair the basis is a dark armoring of about 20 miles in thickness, and outside of it, some kind of more loosely packed covering, a thinner layer, averaging about three miles. In certain areas where the lunar seas and craters are, the upper layer is quite thin, in some cases, uh, non-existent. And as this uh, scientist said, the moon is made inside out. In other words, what's on the outside should really be on the inside, and that supports the idea of a hollowed out planetoid. So, when I started to put this together, and there's a lot more of this in the, in the new book, I then called the Oracle in South Africa, Crater Mutwa, and I found Zulu legends to be incredibly accurate with their symbolism. And, I, and this is the thing, symbolism. You get these um, anthropologists and people, they go around and they look at these uh, shamans and these ancient stories, and they take the blooming things literally. Now, like I said earlier, we now have the tools which make it easier for us because technology is mirroring reality, therefore we have the analogies. When these uh, ancient stories were, were put together, they didn't have that. They had to try to get their point across in simple ways that people of that time could relate to. So they used symbolism. So when I read uh, Arankreda Mutwa, I didn't tell him anything that I'd 
put together or come across or thought, I just said to him, can you tell me any Zulu legends about the moon? And he said, yes, we um, consider the moon to be an egg. Now, when um, you take that literally, you say, the moon's an egg, the anthropologists, the primitive people you know. But no, they symbolize it as an egg for a reason. And this is what he said. The legends, the Zulu legends, say that the moon was brought here hundreds of generations ago by two brothers, Wawani and Umpanku, who were the leaders of the Chittahuri. They were known as the Water Brothers and had, quote, scaly skin like a fish. Now, this story relates almost exactly to the stories found on ancient clay tablets in what is now Iraq, Sumer, Sumerian accounts of the Anunnaki, a non-human race, I would say reptilian race, that came to the earth in the same way that um, um, other parts of the, uh, the world, in the ancient world, talk about. And the Anunnaki, according to these accounts, were led by two brothers called Enki and Enlil. And at least one of them, um, Enki, was symbolized under another name too as a, a relation, in relation to water, exactly the same as this. Zulu legends tell of how Wawani and Mpanku stole the moon in the form of an egg, and this is why they symbolize an egg, not because they're primitive, from the great fire dragon and emptied out the yoke until it was hollow. They then rolled the moon across the sky to the earth and caused cataclysmic events on this planet. They, uh, Zulu legends also say that the, the Chittahuri threatened to move the moon if humans didn't do what they said because of the devastation that would cause. What the two scientists said about this two, three mile um, out, outer kind of um, protection followed by a 20 mile impregnable layer explains one of the uh, anomalies of the moon which the craters are, are, are pretty much of universal depth even though the, the scale of the impact and the size of the crater are, can be massively different, the depth is about the same uh, really. Um, within a very short ratio, and that's, the scientists say, because it, it, it goes into the outer layer, the kind of buffer, but it can't go further than this inner protection layer that is impregnable. Uh, this guy, Don Wilson, wrote a book in the 70s called Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon, and um, these are some of the uh, anomalies that he, he lists, and there are others that can be explained by what we're talking about. Why the moon is a freak world too big and too far out to be a natural satellite of Earth. Why the moon has such a shallow, as shallow craters? Why some moon rocks are older than Earth and as old, at least, as the solar system? Why the moon seems inside out? Why the moon vibrates like a huge gong, transmitting tremors great distances around and through itself? How the moon can produce so many contradictions of data and uh, findings? And uh, in, I think it was in 2001, um, there was a series of people uh, who spoke at the National Press Club in Washington who were insiders of uh, government uh, projects and space projects, etc., who came out to give evidence on things that they saw uh, and were covered up and have never come to light. And one of them was this man, Sergeant Carl Wolf. He was a precision electronics photographic equipment engineer based at the Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. That's the CIA Air Force Base. One of the planes in 9-11 flew out of that and never got there, were meant to. Uh, but what he told at the press uh, club was that um, he was called across to part of this base where they were putting together what they called mosaics. As, as the, um, uh, the craft were flying over the moon and photographing it, they were taking different photographs and piecing them together to, to complete the, the, the landscape. And they had a technical problem, so he went over to try to help them out with it. And then uh, a guy there who, who, who was working with his mosaics um, showed him uh, uh, something of interest. And this is, this is what he said at that um, presentation in Washington. Then he pulled out one of these mosaics and showed this base, which had geometrical shapes that were towers. They were spherical buildings. They were tall towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes. But they were large structures. If I compare it to what I have seen now, because I do have photographs that have uh, artifacts in them that are similar to what I saw. They're massive, and this is a thing. You think about the moon, massive. This is a thing that comes up. The, the structures and technology, and, and if you like, spaceships that these people uh, work with, some of them are absolutely enormous, beyond our comprehension, because they've crossed that Rubicon of understanding how reality works, and therefore you, what possibility is. 
Some of these structures are half a mile in size. They're huge structures. Some of the buildings seem to have very reflective services on them. A couple of structures that I saw reminded me of cooling towers at power generating plants. They had that, uh, that sort of shape. Some of them were just very, very straight and tall with a flat top. Some of them were round. Some of them looked like Quonset huts and, uh, with a dome, a kind of like a greenhouse. The particular shot that I saw, there were several clustered together over the landscape, a fairly large uh, landscape. And other people at that press club um, presentation talked about how NASA systematically um, smudged out or removed um, any non-natural artifacts that they showed on the surface of the moon. And this um, documentary called Moon Rising, you can watch it on YouTube, I think, um, looked at um, photographs uh, taken by uh, something called the Clementine Mission in 1994, I think it was, uh, which took 1.8 million photographs, digital photographs of the moon. And uh, you see the way that some things on the landscape were just blocked out. I mean, what's behind um, this? There's loads of these things which, which they've blocked them out. And then there's this, which has been smudged out. If you take it from another angle, there it is. What the heck is that? Um, one of the kind of astounding things in this uh, documentary is that they said they took this picture to um, a photographic expert who's worked with, with, with NASA. And um, he estimated that this was 10 times the size of Los Angeles. Because you're, you're dealing with phenomenal uh, understanding of how to create this technology uh, because of the understanding of reality. And whatever it is, it doesn't, certainly doesn't seem to be natural. You've got all these other things kind of smudged out and, and you can only see even the smudging in close up. And what I came across when I uh, was putting this together is, is the Death Star in Star Wars. Now, George Lucas, as I've been saying in my books for years, is a massive insider in a galaxy far, far away. I don't think so. I don't think so. This is much closer to home. And, of course, in the uh, Star Wars movies, the Death Star is, it looks very much, of course, like the moon, and it, it was constructed to, to move in on planets and take them over in the same bloody way that I'm talking about in uh, relation to the moon, and there's more to know too. In many ways, this is so symbolic of what uh, we're looking at here, and that's no accident with George Lucas involved. And interestingly, this is Mimas, uh, a, a, a genuine moon of Saturn, and there's the Death Star. I found that quite interesting when you put them together. Anyway, the, the, there's, there was also talk, and more recently there's been further talk in the last few weeks, that one of the moons of Mars, uh, Phobos, is a hollowed out asteroid. This guy said a long time ago in 63, a chief of applied mathematics at NASA, that Phobos might be a colossal base orbiting Mars, and like I say, that's come back into the, um, the debate that it could be. And again, one of the Star Trek episodes was about a hollowed out planetoid that became, uh, in effect, a, a, a spacecraft, uh, a, a world and inside it. And so much of this science fiction that puts this stuff in our face as fiction ain't fiction at all. They're getting it from, from, from fact. Um, so, like I say, there's not just incredible synchronicity and mathematics and size and position between these three uh, bodies, but as the authors of Who Built the Moon point out, there's great synchronicity between things like Stonehenge and other megalithic um, structures and um, these three bodies, particularly um, the moon. And one of the things they point out is that the measurement, uh, which a guy called Alexander Tom came up with, an engineer who studied all these sites in Britain and Europe, like Stonehenge, called the megalithic yard, which is a kind of a, a certain length and he said that all these major, especially Stonehenge and th things like that, broke down into these megalithic yard mathematics. And what the authors of this book are saying is that um, the moon breaks down to the same mathematics. This is what they say. This all seemed very odd. The megalithic structures that were built across Western Europe were frequently used to observe the movements of the sun and the moon. But how could the unit of measure upon which these structures were based be so beautifully integer to the circumference of these bodies as well as the earth. Well, maybe because those that 
built Stonehenge and these megalithic structures in the ancient world, some of which we'd struggle to build now, were also those controlling the moon. And, and okay, this could be controversial, but you know, I've been known to be. I, I think that um, these structures were put there to suppress the Earth's energy grid for reasons I'll come to in a moment, because we are interacting with this energy field all the time. And how do you control all the fish at once? You control the sea they're swimming in. And the way to control humanity and suppress humanity is to suppress the energy field and the energy and information available in that field that we can access. And th these fantastic structures were not done by humans alone, let's say that. Now, now this is where I am probably alone for, for the moment. I don't think I will be forever, but there you go. Um, when I was, um, I mean, I, I do this more in detail in, in the book, but I'm trying to connect dots here. What I came across when I was putting all this together, again, was something I've termed the moon matrix. The first section today is absolutely crucial to understanding how this can work. The moon matrix is a broadcast frequency coming from the moon, which has, in effect, um, hacked in to the human body computer and to the virtual reality universe in general, and has created a sub-reality within the wider virtual reality. Because, I keep saying it, but it's important, we see the moon as physical, but actually its base construct, like everything else in this reality, is waveform information. And I s would say, and of course I think this is going to become more obvious as, as, as the years pass, I would say the moon is actually not just what we've talked about so far, but it's an interdimensional portal through which entities and energies can come out of one reality through into this one. It's their means of entry. Its position, so perfect, as you'll see if you, if you read not just my new book, but Who Built the Moon, um, its position in relation to the moon and the sun is so perfect because that has an effect on creating this sub-reality. I'm saying that this frequency is broadcast from the moon and has created a sub-reality which we are constantly decoding and that the genetic manipulation of humanity, so widely described by the ancients, was to take this body computer and tune it in, connect it to this frequency range I'm calling the moon matrix. This is uh, Neil Haig's concept of moonopoly. This is the world, the structure that we are experiencing. This box recurring round and round limited world. And I am suggesting that we are being massively influenced. In fact, we have been turned into a hive mind by these broadcasts, which are holding us in a sense of limitation to the point where it operates as a default mechanism. Soon as you start to awaken, if you don't keep it going and, 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 and stick with it, then you'll default back because the pressure of this moon matrix is pushing us into this uh, tiny sense of um, limitation. So what virtual realities do is they basically hijack the five senses and get them to decode the information in the computer game and take it into reality. I'm saying that this moon matrix has done exactly the same and it is part of the modus operandi of how planets are taken over in this way. Our five senses have been locked into something else and we're decoding a fake reality. Basically, we are um, connected to this symbolically, which is a hive mind, uh, which is why we are so herd-like when we weren't before. Uh, you know, and if people are going, whoa, okay, what, what, just stick with me, because the, the layers will go on. What, um, what I've been talking about today is the fact that this base vibration from the black holes uh, goes through this cycle, and it elicits different information in the form of photons from the suns, which we decode, and the reality changes. We go through different epochs. What I'm saying is that this moon matrix has hacked in to that photon energy um, stream and has done what the Chinese authorities have done 
uh, to the computer system in China, they have stopped us accessing vast amounts of the virtual reality universe that we used to uh, before. Now, if anyone thinks this is fantastic, that, that we could see things that aren't really there and not see things that aren't there, this is a new scientist. America has just switched from analog to digital television. In the short time of about a year that the analog uh, frequencies are not being accessed because they're going to be filled up by other things like mobile phones, suddenly, for the first time, scientists can see and connect with radio waves from galaxies they couldn't before. Why couldn't they do it before? Because we were watching the flipping telly. Prior to the switchover in America, naturally occurring radio waves at frequencies between 700 and 800 megahertz were obscured by analog TV signals, preventing astronomers from investigating the universe using this band. The freeing up of this bandwidth is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see galaxies in this range. Now, you imagine what is capable by these, this high technology in blocking frequencies so we can't perceive what's there and we perceive things that aren't there. That's what this is doing, I suggest. And I'll add more detail as we go along. In effect, we're operating within a bubble, a virtual reality bubble, within the wider virtual reality universe. And it's connecting in through our crystalline receiver transmission system, same with the Earth, and creating this situation where we are decoding a world that may even not be there, who knows, but certainly is different to the world we think it is. And we go back to this more accurately now. The matrix, I would say the moon matrix, is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out of your window and you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that, world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? You are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison. You cannot smell, taste, or touch a prison for your mind. I would say that prison for your mind is the moon matrix, we, which has put us in a vibrational prison that we can only break out of by becoming conscious and therefore vibrating beyond the walls of the moon matrix, which is a frequency range. And if we're not held in that frequency range, that's why society is structured as it is, with its stress and its fear and its war and its conflict, then we start to break out of its perception prison and we start to say, bloody hell, why didn't I see this before? Because you were there, constantly decoding this thing. Now, like I was just saying, never mind what I've just said about some moon matrix, never mind that, even by its very position, the moon is fundamentally affecting human behavior and human perception. Because the moon is affecting the Earth uh, tilt, the Earth spin, affecting the Earth oceans, therefore it's affecting us. We're 60, 70 percent water. We must be affected by it. And also, and here we come back to the importance of the first section today, it's also fundamentally affecting the um, endocrine system, which connects us to the chakra system, which connects us to out there, part of which is the third eye. It affects the, the hormones that we secrete. And which fundamentally affect human behavior, human health, human perception. Not with any matrix, just by being there. And it fundamentally affects this, the uh, pituitary and the pineal gland that give us the sixth sense ability to see beyond the five senses. And what it has done, it has shut down in so many people, on purpose, the third eye, which in our previous pre-domination mode, we used to perceive vast areas of reality beyond what, which, we, uh, which we can now. Moonth comes from moon. The moon, of course, as it goes around, fundamentally affects our perception of time. We have moonths because of the moon. It's a moonarchy. It's a hybrid moonarchy, monarchy. And one of the major ways they control us, seems to be a modus operandi again, is moony, money, controlled by the Rothschilds. Now, I saw a movie, film, <laughs> some years ago, <laughs> called They Live. It was a B-movie, and it was not just produced and directed, he wrote the music, every bloody thing, by a guy called John Carpenter. You follow John Carpenter's uh, movie-making history, and you will see that he's, he bloody knows a great deal. He'll say he doesn't, he bloody knows a great deal. He, he, he does movies and horrors and Satanism and all this stuff, and he did this movie called They Live, and 
I, I thought it was very symbolically accurate when I first saw it, but now it's unbelievably accurate. For those who haven't seen it, you go on YouTube, put John Carpenter, they live in, you can see it in sections still today. The story was this, it was set in the future, but the future was about now, because it was a few years ago now. There was a massive economic depression, and this guy comes along uh, with his tools on his back, He's walking around America trying to find a job in the building industry. He gets a, a, a one, a short-term one, at this building site. Um, at the end of the day, one of the, one of the uh, other builders said, do you have anywhere to stay? Because there's a ma massive economic depression. People are living in tents, cities, and corrugated iron um, uh, makeshift uh, villages on wasteland. Exactly what's happening in America now, incidentally. And he's now having nowhere to stay. So anyway, he goes back with him to stay at this corrugated iron tent little village thing on, on, a, on the wasteland. And he starts getting interested because there's things going on across the church, across the way that seem very strange to him. And the, the, the village has mocked up some kind of uh, television uh, in, a, in a kind of Heath Robinson way. And when they're watching the television, suddenly it breaks out of the main channel and there's just a man's face on the screen saying, they're here, they're controlling, you don't know, they, all that stuff. And then there's a, there's a police state raid on this village and on this church and they, they bring the bulldozers in and the police and the helicopters and they, they destroy the village. And this builder guy gets away and he comes back and he goes snooping around the church and he finds some uh, cardboard boxes. And uh, he grabs one um, and, and runs into a, a, a back, back uh, a passage uh, behind buildings and he opens the box wondering what's in it. And there's sunglasses. And he's disappointed, sunglasses? What are all these sunglasses in a church for? So he thinks, oh, I'll have one. He puts them in his pocket, throws the others away, walks off into the street. And that's where we pick him up. When he puts these sunglasses on, suddenly the world looks very, very different. It looks like this. He starts to realize that there are people that look human to his naked eye that are anything but human when he puts these sunglasses on. Not only that, where he's seeing adverts with his naked eye, drink Coca-Cola, holiday in Jamaica or whatever, what he can see with the glasses on is subliminal instructions, conform, stay asleep, consume, watch TV, submit, and all the rest of it. All on levels that he can't see. Other people who haven't got the glasses, they're interacting with various people, but he can see are not human. He looks at the president making a speech. He's not human when he looks at him through the glasses. Same with a number of people in law enforcement. Uh, news readers were the same. And the, where, it, where it goes is that at the end of the movie, they realize that the reason that people cannot see without the glasses, um, what he can see, is because there is a frequency being transmitted from the top of a television tower which is pre preventing the population seeing what they would normally see if that frequency wasn't being broadcast. And what they do is they break the, the broadcast frequency, they, 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 they stop the dish working, and people are sitting in bars, and suddenly they can now see the guy next to them is not human. What a bloody laugh that would be, wouldn't it? And there's people out having sex and then realizing, hey, I, I didn't really come home with you. Tell you the funny thing, a lady in Canada told me this story happened to her. I spoke in Canada years ago now, and I met this lady. She was a, a, a power-dressing businesswoman, you know, very of this world. But she'd had this experience, and she was shaking when she told me the story. Um, she said that um, she got this, this, this boyfriend who had a dark side, she said, who, that he, he, he knew about and he was trying to deal with. And they come home, and they go into the bedroom, and there was a, there was a, a shelf at, to, at top of her bed, and standing there was the book, The Biggest Secret, which for, for the first time I introduced this reptilian thing. He then goes crazy, she said, when he sees the book. And he, he got her to throw it away. Oh, what are you reading that rubbish for? And all that stuff. Mind you, he's not alone in that. Um, and then they start having sex. And he, he's kind of on top of her. And she said, I had my hand on the, the bottom of his back. And suddenly he started getting very, very violent. And I started getting frightened. And she said, then I, I, my hand was pushed back. And she said, I looked over his shoulder. And, and my hand had been pushed back by a tail. He sprouted a tail. She said, I screamed, threw him off. And he, for a second or two in front of me, he was totally reptilian and then morphed back to human and ran out of the house, never seen him again. But these bizarre stories um, that are bizarre to our reality, I've been told all over the world by people from all different walks of life, people in the Swiss banking system and all that stuff, all different kinds of people. So um, 
this frequency is that equivalent of that broadcast dish on the top of that TV tower which was stopping those people in that movie seeing what they would normally see. Now when we bring this down into the reptilian world, well, it gets interesting because we live in a society that is a expression of the reptilian brain. This man, Carl Sagan, a cosmologist, very famous, he wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden, in which he was looking at the effect of reptilian genetics on human behavior. And he uh, said, you cannot, in effect, understand human behavior without understanding the reptilian aspect of, of, of all this. And we come back to what I mentioned earlier. This part of the brain, known as the reptilian brain or the R complex to scientists, is so fundamental to human behavior, as, as I'll explain in a second. And I'm saying that this genetic manipulation that the ancients talk about in, all over the world by the serpent gods locked us in to the moon matrix through the reptilian brain because it connects into the hive mind of the reptilian species in the moon. And this, like I say, fundamentally expresses itself as the world um, that we live in. And I'll, I'll come to that more in a second. Now, in the 60s, around that time, there's a guy called Carlos Castaneda who wrote books based on the teachings uh, of, a, of a Central American shaman source called Don Juan Matos. Um, some people say Don Juan didn't exist. Some people say he did. Whatever, the words that were put into his mouth are just absolutely extreme, extraordinarily accurate. And I read this quote coming up after I put this stuff together that I've been talking about. Um, this is what Don Juan Matus said in, in these books. We have a predator that came from the depth of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings and its prison, are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary, and egomenical. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators have engaged themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous maneuver from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. They gave us their mind. And that is how I suggest they've done it. We are connected if we operate within the hive reptilian brain mind. We are operating on a collective mind, which is pouring out this constant sense of anxiety, fear, worry, stress, because that, A, keeps us within the confines of the frequency range of the moon matrix, i.e. attached to it, and it also um, elicits the emotional, low vibrational energy on which they feed. Behind all these pyramids of banking, medicine, religion, business, politics, is the reptilian hive mind. It connects into all these control systems that run our society. And now let's look at the character traits of the reptilian brain. Is this our society or what? This is mainstream science, by the way. 
From the reptilian brain, we get primitive and emotional responses. Cold-blooded behavior, lack of empathy, if not balanced out by other parts of the brain. And territoriality, this is mine, get out. A desire to control, an obsession with hierarchical structures of power. Aggression, might is right, winner takes all. And it is dominating our sense of reality and our reaction and responses to events and other people. This is the word that sums up the reptilian brain. Survive, survival. It doesn't think, it hasn't got the ability to think, it reacts. That's why it can react so fast. There are good things about it. When you're driving along in your car and someone walks in front of you, what rams the anchors on immediately without thinking, instantly, is the reptilian brain. But when that starts to impact on other parts of our behavior and our lives, then it becomes a very negative thing indeed. It is the reptilian brain and its fear of not surviving. It's always scanning the environment for threats, not just physical threats, but threats on other, in, in other levels of, of our um, experience, which I'll, which I'll uh, explain in a second. And therefore, the targeting of the reptilian brain and the constant triggering it, or, or, of it is what gives us this constant fear, this constant stress, worry that goes on in all areas of our lives. Will I meet the rent at the end of the month? Oh my God, will I lose my job? Oh my God. And the more that we can be put in fear, here we go, the more we operate in the reptilian brain. That's why we're constantly given reasons to fear and to be anxious. Be afraid, be very afraid. The big bag monster's coming as soon as we've invented him. And when he's gone, we'll have another. Terrorism, ah! Global warming, ah! Swine flu, ah! The economy, ah! I don't look like her, ah! I don't look like him, ah! Constant, constant reasons to fear. locking us into the control system. And it's not just physical survival, it's survival of status, of power, of reputation, superiority, intellectual preeminence, acquiescence to a hierarchy and authority is another aspect of the reptilian brain. I know my place. And you know, when, 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 when you put information out that challenges the, 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 the status quo view of scientists and academics, they react vehemently. Why? Because the reptilian brains kicked in. Survival of their reputation, survival of their belief system. When you uh, put out information that challenges people's religious beliefs, not you're saying you're wrong and all that stuff, you're just saying here's some information, which if it's true, th that, that, that can't, be, can't be right. They vehemently attack you. Why? Because the reptilian brains kicked in, because the belief system is uh, in danger of not surviving. Uh, fear of money. Money is... Uh, fundamentally reptilian brain, uh, two, two polarities of it. One, fear of not surviving, fear of not having enough to pay the rent, to eat. And on the other hand, you can get so locked into the reptilian brain, and this is what the, um, the hybrid bloodlines do, that you equate survival with far more than is necessary to survive. So you get people, especially in these bloodline networks, who have got more money than they could spend in a hundred lifetimes, but they get up with the sun every morning to go and earn bloody more. It's an obsession, it's an addiction, and it's connected to the reptilian brain, which fundamentally drives our perception of reality. Don Juan Matus again. I know that even now, though you never have suffered hunger, you have hunger and food anxiety which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that at any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them and they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against this fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reasoned here we go that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness, that are mythological legends nowadays. And then everything seems to disappear, and we now have a sedated man. 
What I'm saying is, what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Modus operandi, done it many times. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, is no longer magical. He is an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man, but the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. This is what becoming conscious brings us out of. Control of perception is the bottom line of this conspiracy. You know, I'm all for exposing 9-11s and banking scams and not engineered wars, but this is the bottom line, and if we miss it, then we're going round in circles and we'll get nowhere. Interestingly, the Zulu legends say that before the moon came, they used to worship the sun as female, and then everything changed. This change from perceiving the sun as female to worshipping it as male made possible the creation of warlike kings that took what they wanted by force. Everything changed when the perception of the sun changed. And the perception of the sun changed when the moon matrix kicked in and changed our perception of everything. And in so many ways, this Avatar movie, I'm not saying Cameron symbolized it like this, I'm saying what it symbolized to me. The blue people who were in total harmony with everything else, I'm saying to me, are symbolic of humans as we were before the predator came. And then the American troops with their high technology, let's kill people, we want these resources, so let's just go and get them and destroy everything to do so. They symbolize to me this reptilian intervention. And they even have in the Avatar movie, of course, the concept of the possession of the blue people so that they could infiltrate their society while outwardly looking like they do and not being uh, known to be who they are. These reptilians look down a different timeline to us because they're, they're on a different wavelength. They're able to see further into what we call the future than we are. And therefore, if you access this network of secret societies, especially the inner circle, you can access the projected future of human society which this is planning. Therefore, you can write prophetic novels which further down what we call the timeline turn out to be staggeringly accurate. All you need to do is to access that projection. And you do it by accessing the secret society network. This, the Fabian Society in London, created in 1884, is one of those societies. It, the deeper inner core, that have access to that timeline and that projected agenda. And this guy was one of them, a Fabian. And that's the Fabian logo, by the way. The wolf in sheep's clothing. Perfect. Perfect. It created, in effect, the Labour Party in Britain, and it influences uh, massively uh, the, the left, not only the left, but what we call the left centre of politics, not just in Britain, but in other countries. Australia, too, for instance, very, very powerfully. When people have said to me in the past, you know, what, what's planned, I've said to them, well, you can read two books and see it, just put them together. George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. This was uh, published in 1948, this was in 1932. Uh, put the two together, this talks about the drugs and, and, and all the rest of it, and the mind control, this talks about the, the sort of police state. Put them together, you got it. They were incredibly prophetic. I've been saying for years they weren't novels, or that their source wasn't novels. Turns out that Aldous Suxley taught French to a man called Eric Blair then, now uh, George Orwell, at Eton College, and introduced him to the Fabian Society. And this was the knowledge base, plus no doubt others connected, where they got their, these, these concepts. And uh, what they said all those decades ago, Oxley's uh, case 1932, is now happening in incredible detail. And it seems that Orwell rebelled against what he heard and wrote 1984 to try to expose it, uh, and some researchers suggest, they may well be right, that he called it 1984 when it was set kind of about now um, because 1984 was the 100th anniversary of the creation of the Fabian Society. We reached a point where these 
entities and their hybrid bloodlines, the Illuminati bloodlines, they think the takeover of humanity is almost complete. And when you look at it, it may seem to be that that's the case. They think the game is over. It's gone so far. They must be bloody joking. These people... These people are in for the shock of their lives in the next few years. The shock of their lives. Because they can access so much, but they can't access beyond that. And they think the game's over because it seems to be here, but they can't perceive there. And when that comes in here, and it's very close to doing so, game over. Well, we've come a long way, haven't we? And what we're going to do now then is have a, a break for, uh, say, 45 uh, minutes, and I'll come back and look at the world as it is now and what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good so far. Yeah. yeah, the reason I'm here basically is to see, find out exactly what's going on in the world and uh, find out exactly what the hidden conspiracy there is that's going on. Yeah, today, basically. It's not just David Icke that's saying this, this stuff about the moon. There's, there's Alex Collier, uh, the Andromedan contactee, who says that the moon was towed here but from Ursa Minor, which is near the Alpha Draconis star system, by the reptilians. I don't think he's necessarily said anything that I haven't known already, but he just he's very eloquent and he's put it together in such a beautiful package that it just makes it very easy for anyone to understand. I just like the way David puts things across, you know, it, he's not afraid, he's not afraid, he's got no fear in him whatsoever, doesn't give one iota about what people think and I think we can all learn from that, definitely. Ever since I was little, I've always thought that something was wrong. The way that society, because I believe that reality and the, system, and the system that we live in are two completely different things. I've I found it very difficult to concentrate in school because I was always told what to believe. It was very structured and whenever I used to ask why, nobody could ever give me an answer. And um, it seems that David Icke seems to give those answers and opens up your perception to new possibilities. Some concepts of it I can agree with, definitely with the controlling aspect of it. Because there's got, like, when you look at the controlling thing, there's got to be a way how they're really keeping us controlled. So I would say with that, with that aspect of it, yeah, I do agree with it. I have read and I have seen many videos, and I think he's great because there is a lot of truth in everything he says, and there will be a lot of changes from now on. I admire what he's doing. I think he's got a lot of courage to step out and enlighten a lot of people um, about what's going on in the world that the majority of us don't really understand or know about. So he's, um, I give him a thumbs up, really.